All right, everyone. Hello again. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for those who just joined viewing in. Um, again, be sure to join us on Zoom if you can, so you can um, interact with our panel live. We'd love to take your questions and comments. Uh, so welcome to our Women of the Arts live virtual panel part two. Um, we have another lineup of amazingly talented and accomplished artists with us here today um, who will be continuing our discussion of feminism in the art world. Now on Monday, we got to see um, some very informative and also very personal um, presentations as well as some valuable history about female artists of the past. We're expanding on that. Um, and also today, each of our panelists are going to continue to share their experience and opinions from a very diverse array of their individual perspectives. So uh, firstly, I would like to um, begin with a few quick guidelines um, that we ask everyone to follow for tonight's event. Uh, firstly, each panelist uh, will be presenting for a range of about 15 to 20 minutes each um, during these presentations. We ask that you please remain muted as to not distract from the artist. At the end of the presentations, we will be taking your questions and comments through a live question and answer segment. Of course, we ask that everyone please be respectful and courteous of everyone at all times. Um, lastly, you can find more information about our panelists and IAMA, the museum itself, in the question and chat box um, right below this live stream, including a link to our donation page. You know, we truly rely on uh, support like yours to keep special events like this one um, coming your way. So any amount that you can give really is appreciated. Um, okay, so without further ado, let's dive right in. Um, let me introduce our first panelist, uh, Larissa Safarian. Now, Larissa is um, an award-winning artist uh, based in Los Angeles, California, and is also the founder of Wood Symphony Gallery. Um, she has also been included in numerous publications, including her author book, Masters of Contemporary Wood Art. Um, her delicate but very intense, expressive, and unique work is reminiscent of the joyful energy and emotionality that she carries with her every day. Now, these are meant to depict very human interactions and the emotions and motivations that are behind them. So Larissa, thank you so much for being us here today. Katrina, do you hear me? There we go. Oh, great. Hi there. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you. I, I was saying thank you uh, for inviting me and it's a real honor to be here today speaking with all these beautiful ladies and uh, especially that it's a uh, history of women, uh, women history month. And um, it, it, it's really um, wonderful that we have gathered today and we're going to share uh, our experiences as an artist and uh, it, uh, as females um, in art. Um, I guess uh, in your first panel, you discussed a little bit of history uh, and how it started. Uh, but I, I, uh, I was also reading, uh, I did a little research and uh, at first, uh, it was interesting that it started with a, as a uh, as a week of women history in uh, when was it 1980s in early 1980s. Then it became a month uh, when uh, Ronald Reagan uh, declared a month of women, and uh, I hope soon it will be not a week or a month. Or it will become a year. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, I really hope that it's, of course, important uh, that we celebrate women in arts and in other fields like science, uh, because we uh, science, literature, music, in el all the fields, uh, we can find uh, women who change the history. And um, I, I wish uh, there comes a time when we celebrate 
athletes, not only women, not only men, or regarding their race, gender, color, will celebrate everyone and humans in general and their creativity and their contribution to uh, culture and society. Um, it's, um, uh, I, I think of, as an artist, from artist perspective, it's uh, important for you to be recognized for your art, for the art you create, not uh, regardless your gender. Um, as an artist myself, uh, I want when uh, people view my work to, to try to feel it, uh, to go through the emotions that I was feeling while creating it. And I don't want them to think um, that, okay, this uh, a female created this art. Um, I, I, um, I think that uh, art in general does not have uh, gender or color. It's not feminine or masculine. It, uh, and each artist should be valued, recognized for his own or her own talent, not, not gender or, or race or color or any other uh, individual differences that we all have. Um, and throughout the history, if you go back and uh, just read the uh, biographies of great artists, like uh, just one example, Georgia Coffey, you, you can see she was the first female artist who had a a uh, solo retrospective exhibition uh, in modern Museum of Modern Contem Mo Modern Art. But um, what is important, she didn't want uh, to be remembered as the first woman who had an important exhibition, but he, she wanted to be remembered as an important artist, not an important female artist, but an artist in general. And for me as well, uh, it, it's important uh, to be recognized for my art, uh, not uh, that I am a female. Uh, you mentioned uh, about the Wood Symphony Gallery, and I want to uh, speak a little about it, uh, how it was created and how I became a curator and uh, a founder of the gallery. So my father was a, a, is an uh, artist. He works in wood and uh, usually in this sector, only men, majority of them are men. Um, uh, and uh, of course we have a few female artists and it's really interesting to see how men uh, uh, are accepting their female um, peers and how they celebrate their uh, achievements. And in my exhibitions, uh, which I curate, I don't choose uh, works based on their, uh, based on the artists who created it, female or male. I look at the pictures. Uh, I don't even uh, read their biographies because uh, of course it's important. Uh, I do research and I bear uh, deep research and I know everything about my artists that we represent, but uh, I judge them by their uh, talent, not by anything else. And I think it's important. And I'm uh, really happy that we have a female artists and their work is uh, as beautiful as uh, our male artists who usually uh, are uh, the majority are uh, male artists. Uh, I also want uh, to speak about the importance of uh, women in throughout the century. We were creating, uh, we were involved in arts, even if, uh, yes, there were times that uh, we were not represented uh, in museums. Uh, or we couldn't go to art schools because of uh, gender. But I think now uh, things have changed. Uh, we have ex uh, freedom to express ourselves artistically. We can. We have freedom to to choose any profession that we profession that we want. And uh, I think now it's more important to focus on 
creating, on spreading love, on creating happiness. Uh, we have that freedom. At, at some point, yeah, it's of course was important to for certain people who were pioneers to fight for our rights, right? But now we have it. Now we have to just enjoy it. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and uh, just do whatever we are doing best. And whatever is not created by women, it's created for women. I, I think you will agree. And we are, even if they are created by men, they, it's, they create for us. We are their motivation. We are their muses. And imagine uh, if uh, women were not you know, living in this world, their mass life would be so uninteresting, right? They won't have motivation to create. They, uh, there won't be any competition. So I think uh, we are, as women, uh, valued. And we should not, um, sometimes uh, women under estimate themselves. Uh, we should not do that. We, uh, uh, of course, we, whenever we see that um, something is wrong or our rights are not considered or we see some discrimination, of course, we have to speak up. But I think there comes a point when we just, uh, we have enough freedom of speech, of expression, of uh, everything now. Uh, it's time uh, for us to, uh, to bloom, to show all our potential uh, and make this world more beautiful. And I think the purpose of art should be uh, creating beauty in this world. And that's what, what we have always done through different methods and ways. I think uh, if you have any questions or if our audience have any questions. Oh, and uh, I forgot to uh, share. I have a few slideshows. I would like to show uh, my art, uh, what, what I create, what I love doing. Let me try to share it. Please let me know if you can see it. Do you see it, Katrina? Yeah. Oh, great. Okay, so uh, th this is a painting uh, and a sculpture. I use eggshells to create uh, my artworks. Uh, this is a painting, it's called Summer Rain. I used uh, acrylic paint on canvas and eggshells. Uh, let's go to the other page. I, uh, this is Mirage of Rhythm. Uh, it's actuals, and I created this uh, during the pandemic uh, in the beginning. Um, and this is colorful. It's all a uh, canvas covered with the different colored actuals. Peace in the cows. This is a sculpture. spring in the mountains and I'm happy that spring is coming and the summer is coming <laughs> that makes me happy and makes me uh, motivates me to create more and use bright colors and this uh, if you see in the middle of this uh, uh, painting, there are two little uh, parrot eggs and people, when they see and notice those tiny eggs, they ask, wow, is this really an eggshell too? I say, yes, <laughs> it is eggshell. Yeah, and it's, it's especially interesting when children see my work and they are more curious. They, are, they have more freedom to express their amusement and ask questions. So. Uh, it, it, it's always interesting to see the reaction of people uh, to what you create. Smiling to the world, butterflies. Uh, this is a sculpture. Uh, I used emu egg and a duck egg and some pins. This is an ostrich egg. It, it's huge. If you can see, you can compare it with the small egg inside the black egg. And uh, 
the ostrich. This is a collaboration with my father. Uh, it's a uh, coco bolo, the wood, and two tiny parrotheads. Uh, it's mother and child, very close to our uh, topic today, <laughs> femininity. Okay, uh, I think I have more, but uh, you got an idea of what I use or my method and uh, medium that I use. Okay, uh, do we have any questions, Katrina? Yeah, no, Larissa, it's, um, you know, that what really stuck to me is it's time. You know, that's such a powerful, such a powerful message, you know, really, stu um, really stood out to me. I think um, what I um, really, uh, really take away from, the, from, uh, from your presentation, also from your work is embrace our fragility. You know, there, there's nothing um, to shy away from that as women. You know, it's important to embrace what makes, what makes, what makes us yeah. Um, yeah. who we are. And it's, um, and it's important for us to lift each other up. You know, there's a lot, um, a lot of resources right now, but I think we are all our greatest resource. So definitely. I totally agree with you. Yes. And we should embrace uh, the differences that we have. Imagine if uh, there was a field of flowers and all the flowers were the same color. It would be uninteresting, right? And, and each of us should uh, consider ourselves a flower and a different flower. Uh, and we should not be shy of our color. We should really embrace who... Uh, whatever we are, our souls, our uh, creativity, and the, as women, we should know that uh, we are the creators of everything beautiful uh, in this world. I'm not uh, saying that men uh, are not creating. Of course they are, and they are creating in a different way, and that that's the whole uh, point to the recognize our differences and, and embrace it and um, not compete with each other. We, we just uh, uh, help each other to, uh, to make this world a better place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is still there. Yeah, definitely. There, there, there is, there is that, um, there is that factor. I th think that, um, want to don't want to say like the missing piece don't know if that's the right wording but um i think you know the male artist support is kind of what um also is most vital now that we've come so far there's still work to be done though you know and that's a big part of what could continue to um to you know, uh, move forward in equity. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much again, Larissa. Um, so, um, let me introduce our next panelist will be Dorka King. Now, uh, Dorka is in a will award-winning artist and filmmaker, um, as well as the principal of Keen on Art, which is an art advisory that specializes in public art. She has been instrumental in the success of some of the most innovative and visible art projects in the Bay Area, including the Bay Lights, which is a 25,000 LED light installation by Leo Villarreal uh, for the Bay Bridge and Seeing Spheres which is the iconic artwork of um, La Forêt Les for the Chase Center. And in 2011, she was appointed to the San Francisco Arts Commission, where she chairs the Visual Arts Committee that commissions all artwork pertaining to the city's public art program. Additionally, she is the co-founder of Sites Unseen, which is a program that brings art programming to neglected alleys in downtown San Francisco. So Dorka, it is an honor to have you here with us today. 
Thank you so much, Katrina. And I have to say, I had a lot of fun preparing for this um, panel. Um, I wasn't really sure what I was gonna talk about. And then I just started researching uh, the history of women in public art. And I think that I uh, just actually spoke, I wrote a book on women in the environment and I think I'm actually going to turn this into a book. So Katrina, thank you for, for having me on this panel, but also for inspiring me, I think for, uh, for my next project. So I am not going to do the history of women in public art because we could be here for hours and hours. This is gonna be a very quick overview. Um, and I'll talk just briefly about myself also at some point, but, um, uh, and I'm gonna focus on US artists and Hold on a second, let me hear. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully my screen doesn't freeze. Okay, all right, so here we go. So um, I really started looking back, trying to find out when the first public artist in Western, the Western world was. Um, and I thought it was fascinating. I found this dictionary of employment open to women um, that was published in London by the Women's Institute in 1898. And it identified the kinds of commission that women artists uh, who wanted to have a career as a sculptor might expect. And this included uh, light fittings, forks and spoons, racing cups, presentation plates, medals and jewelry, as well as monumental work and the stone decoration of domestic facades and architects. So already um, in the uh, late 19th century, women were working and were allowed to work in this field, even though it was really a male profession. And some, uh, many of them uh, in Europe and the United States were working on major um, public artworks. And there was a lot of cross discipline. A lot of women sculptors in the late 1800s was coming um, to, to Europe to, um, to learn how to sculpt. Um, the first sculpture um, actually in Paris um, in the Jardin de Luxembourg in, um, that was commissioned in 1910 actually was created by an American, Malvina Hoffman, uh, and it's called R Russian Dancers. And I just think it's so modern for 1910. It's really an extraordinary um, piece. Unfortunately, it no longer exists because when the Germans came um, in 1942, they melted it down to probably use it for um, you know, military purposes. Um, then moving back to the United States, um, this is a uh, this is a, a public artwork by Edmonia Lewis, uh, who is uh, was um, part African American and part Native American. Her father was African American, her mother was Native American, and she attended Oberlin College in the 1860s. And while she was accused of theft and of poisoning her classmates and was beaten up by her classmates, she was brought to trial. She had this just incredibly wild story. She continued to pursue sculpting. And then she, moved, she got a scholarship to go to Rome um, uh, and study sculpture. And so between 1866 and 1872, she completed a, a variety of sculptures um, and busts um, uh, of Native Americans uh, particularly women, uh, Hiwatha and Minnepaha, who was from, um, you know, I don't know if you know the Harry Wadsworth, uh, Henry Wadsworth epic poem, The Song of uh, Hiawatha. Um, so just this, you know, I never even knew this woman existed. I just was, am just fascinated by this, her story that we have of public art that really we don't know that much about. Um, then I just love this photo, uh, this tiny woman doing this ginormous piece. Um, and she was considered one, this is Harriet Goodhue Hosmer, and she was considered one of the most distinguished female sculptures in America during the 19th century. She was really known as the first female professional sculpture, sculptor in the United States. Um, and she also had a lot of technical experience and expertise, and she pioneered a process for turning limestone into marble. And this is Thomas Hart Benton, which was uh, that she created, which is the first public monument in the state of Missouri, not exactly known as the most progressive town, I mean, progressive state. Um, and then not too long after that, in 1971, uh, there, the first woman to create art in the US Capitol was Vinnie uh, Reem. And she was only 18 years old when she signed this contract to produce the statue of Abraham Lincoln, which is now in the US Capitol Rotunda. And um, it, this caused a huge public relations calamity. Uh, critics accused her of using her feminine charms to get her to get this job. 
um, and said that she was completely inexperienced, even though she had been studying for years with um, another sculptor. And then as we continue to move forward, I think one of the things that's really interesting that happened in the United States was that in the late 1890s, we had these world fairs and there was the women's building that celebrated women artists in general, but also had a whole sculpture component. The first women's building in the first fair, I can't remember exactly the date, was designed by a man, but this one, the second one in 1893 was designed by Sophia Hayden. And she invited a group of women, it was a competition um, to create artwork, architectural embellishments, which a lot of women did at that time um, on the building. And I don't know if you, oh, I'm gonna go back here for a second. I don't know if you can see in the middle of that building, there's that um, uh, top of the, of, the, of the building there. And here you can see it. This was uh, by actually a San Francisco uh, local artist, Alice Rideout. Um, it was called Women's Work. And so this was a boss relief on, on the outside of that building. So women were being recognized in the late 1800s for being artists, for being sculptures. They were showing. It's really fascinating to, to look at what the heck happened, you know, once we got to contemporary art and there were no women in museums, you know. Um, and then sort of, it was really interesting for me to look at what different women were, works, sculptural works were, um, and so this work was unveiled in 1905 at the Lewis and Clark Centennial, and a lot of public art throughout history of the United States was supported by women. They raised the money, um, and this was, uh, this was in Portland, it still exists, and it was spearheaded by a woman and her friends, um, and it, in the inscription on the bottom of it reads, erected by the women of the United States in memory of the only woman in the Lewis and Clark expedition and in honor of the pioneer mother of Oregon. So already these are, these are very feminist women who are wanting to make their marks and, and leaving a mark uh, you know, in, in, the, in the commons, in the public sphere. sphere. And then um, the, this is the first historical figure uh, female figure in, in New York City that went up in 1915. This is Joan of Arc um, by Anna von Hyatt Huntington, who was among New York City's most prominent sculptors in the early 20th century. 20th century. She had a very, very, very successful career. This sculpture came 145 years after the first male sculpture in New York City. It took us 145 years to get a sculpture in New York. Um, and the first black sculpture of a black woman, uh, it wasn't until 2008 in New York. And this is um, Harriet Tubman by Allison Saar. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but Allison is an amazing, amazing artist. He lives in, uh, he's based out of Los Angeles and her, her work focuses on the African diaspora and black female identity. Um, and so this was, you know, not until 2008. There were some really amazing artists, uh, African-American artists um, that were working in the early 1900s. This is Augusta Savage. Uh, and she was married off at 15, had a child at 16, and she still made her way to Cooper Union in New York City in the 20s. She completely blew her professors away and graduated from the program that's a four-year program in three years. Um, and she also got a scholarship to go to Paris, to go to Europe, to study. And then she came back in the 30s <clears throat> and she opened her own art school in Harlem. She became the first director of the Harlem Community Arts Center. She was the first African-American elected to the National Association of Women Painters and Sculptors. And her work is really quite astounding. So, and this is the first sculpture by a woman of women in the state capitol. And that was um, in 1920, um, and that is Adelaide Johnson. And she was devoted to the, to the uh, women's movement. She considered herself the sculptor of the women's movement. Um, and, uh, you know, this is uh, Liz uh, Elizabeth Caddy, Susan Anthony, and Lucretia Moth, all leaders in the, in the feminist movement of the United States. So, that's kind of a little history. Now I'm going to kind of move into more contemporary art and some of, so kind of in the sort of the 60s and 70s, uh, it became less of a neoclassical field uh, of, of sculptural work and women started to explore different aspects of themselves. And also they started to explore 
their environment, which usually had a more local um, feel to it than sort of the environment of a man, which was more sort of national parks environment for women tended to be around their homes and their neighborhoods and their communities. Um, this amazingly is the first um, sculpture by Louise Bourgeois. And she was commissioned, this is her first public sculpture, I should say. And she was commissioned by a um, energy company. And so these are reflective uh, mirrors that are, that are reflecting the sun and cr creating heat within those pieces. Um, most of you probably know her work, uh, like that is more like this, which really is exploration of her childhood. Um, this is called Mother. Uh, she had a very difficult relationship with her father. Uh, she had a complicated relationship with her mother, but she um, really was someone who uh, was investigating her own self. She was in, uh, investigating issues like concerns, like fear, vulnerability, and loss of control, and also her sexuality. Um, and she, her, her work became more and more um, sexually explicit, and she <laughs> was a big advocate of, um, you know, fighting censorship as well as defending women's rights, gay rights, etc. So Yoyo Kusama, it was just her birthday uh, yesterday. Again, someone who really was exploring um, in the 60s uh, sexual liberation. I don't know if you can see this, but this is actually a sofa made out of penises. And she did a lot of penis furniture <laughs> and played around and about a lot of um, uh, performance art in that. In that. Um, so she really, used, and also used her body as a canvas um, and is well known for her OCD dots, uh, um, uh, which really to her express affinity. And then started doing these uh, large scale public forms. Um, this is an amazing piece that's um, in the Beneze Museum in um, Japan. And so for her, this is very voluptuous. It's like a woman. And then I have to say this, uh, Nikki de saint Phalle, again, around the same time, really exploring the female body. This is Les Nana, this is at uh, Pompidou uh, in Paris, and really exploring, you know, different, different, moving away from the stereotypical woman. Uh, and very fun and very lively uh, with a lot of humor, which for me is really what makes great art when you, it kind of stops you, it makes you uh, look at things differently and also brings a smile to your face. Here's another Nana uh, that's a fountain. And then uh, really one of the most uh, important, one of the most important uh, feminist pieces uh, in the in probably in, in art in general, but um, it's certainly in, in American art is Judy Chicago. Uh, this was done in 1970, uh, and if you ever have the opportunity to go to the Brooklyn Museum, that's where it is now. But it traveled around the country, and it's a ballroom size um, artwork um, that has uh, uh, places for 39 historical feminists uh, from the Western world, and each plate. Um, has a decoration um, and they're each, and everything is, the pot, the plate was made by hand, everything was made, there's uh, napkins and uh, placemats that have engravings and, and words on it. Um, I'll show you a close up right here. I mean, they're really, some of them are very sexual, really beautifully done, really uh, speaks to women's work. Um, and then another uh, close to a thousand women are honored. You can see sort of uh, on the floor uh, with their names. Um, and she really has spent her entire life um, being a political powerhouse, um, starting a, a women's only art studio in California and New Mexico and really um, being a, just a full on uh, activist uh, artist. And then of course there's Barbara Kruger um, I love this, you know, she says, you know, one guy says he's the strongest because he has the biggest weapon. His rival says, no, mine is bigger and I won't reduce its size. I mean, the play on words is unbelievable. Um, and again, <clears throat> looking at what was happening in the 70s around media and advertising 
and looking at the stories that weren't being told about women. She was the one that did uh, the, that big poster, My Body is a Battleground. Um, and she really kind of led the way for gallery representation for women. She was the first female artist to be represented by Mary Boone, who was you know, a major uh, gallerist in New York City. And so those were some artists that were really exploring body and form. And then there was another group of artists um, who were exploring the environment. Agnes Deans is, was an incredible, as she's still alive, she actually just unbelievably had her first um, retrospective um, in, uh, in New York. But here she, she grew a wheat field um, in, in New York City and then uh, at Battery Park and then took all that wheat to feed the poor. I'm gonna have to run through this. I'm realizing I'm like running kind of late here. So I'm gonna just run through this. Um, and then uh, Holt, Nancy Holt really wanted to take a look at the way uh, we, we experience the environment. You know, so many of land artists, uh, men land artists really destroyed. I mean, Spiral Getty is, Jetty is beautiful, but it destroyed the land around it. So she was like, how do we experience the land in different ways without destroying it? Same with Maya Lin. And then I'm gonna move into sort of the contemporary world. I think one of the most incredible uh, public arts works that I've ever seen is was Kara Walker's um, uh, work. Um, and uh, this is in the Domino Sugar Factory. It is uh, entirely made out of sugar. And here she is, this giant sphinx, but that also really represents um, stereotypes of black women, sort of the mammy, as well as the overly sexualized um, black women. And here it is in this domino sugar factory where poor people and slaves really slaved here to create sugar. Um, that, is, that is a poison. <laughs> um, and so, you know, here in New York, uh, in, there was uh, the first uh, sculpture of uh, women pioneers um, and I don't know if you heard about the issues that occurred around that, um, but there was a, uh, basically people were upset at first that there was not a woman of color that was, um, that was not included and they finally um, included Sojourner Truth. And this came up in the 1920s. I'm sorry, in last year, 2020. I don't know if you all followed sort of the issues around the Lava Thomas Maya Angelou piece here in San Francisco. Um, but this is an artwork that's going to be coming uh, in, in San Francisco in about a, a year. And so again, you know, looking at female representation in the commons. And then this is one of my artworks. Again, I'm looking at sites, at land, um, at how one responds to the site. I'm very interested in site-specific work. This is called Caruso's Dream. Um, that, that was based on... Um, the dream that we believed Enrico, Enrico Caruso, who was the most famous opera tenor, uh, who came to San Francisco during the earthquake. Um, so this is one of my pieces. And this is another one of my pieces called Language of the Birds, which is a flock of flying books taking off um, over the plaza. And they look like words have dropped out of the plaza floor. It's at the intersection of Chinatown and North Beach um, and Little Italy. So we've incorporated words from phrases, um, from books, from authors, from the neighborhood, from the history, beginning of history. So again, really an exploration of sight. Um, and then I just quickly wanted to talk about two other, uh, some other local artists who have just finished major public artworks. This is Hugh and Starkweather. This is a piece that's, um, they did a giant glass piece that's again exploring sight and, and space and, and travel and movement. And this is for the you know, new Union Square um, uh, Metro. And this is a piece that I've just completed with Masako Miki. And uh, she is really someone um, who has been exploring, um, it, it's a series of, of nine painted sculptures. And she's, her, she's very interested in ancestral, ancestral traditions and folklore that speak to the interrelatedness, interrelatedness of all beings and in, inanimate and inanimate. And so these are 
um, basically what she calls shapeshifters. And she's really looking at, so here she's taking this notion of the human body and, and, and the female body. And she's now looking at sort of gender fluidity and uh, the spirit of diversity and vibrancy and innovation um, and how we can shape shift and change. And so I think we see this sort of evolution of how women have been um, looking at public art in the public sphere from going towards from the neoclassical to exploring their own bodies, to exploring the environment, um, to exploring media, to exploring the, the places where they live. And now Misako has taken it to this next level of really exploring this fluidity that we all are experiencing right now um, in this century. So thank you. Wonderful, Dorga, thank you so much. I think it's um, so, I'll, I'll start with a comment. You know, let's go to the Facebook comment. It says, enjoy art life. I love that comment. You are so right, whoever posted that. You know, <laughs> public art is art that we live in, you know? That's what I say. Um, it's so fascinating to see the coupling between you, um, you know, that and the environment, whether it be, you know, our natural world or our, um, or our cities. I'm, I'm really interested to know what, what, what brought you, brought you to that sector? You know, what inspired you to join public art? I was very fortunate. I had a friend of mine who, my background is in politics and in film. And I had a friend of mine who was a public artist who was um, having some issues dealing with um, sort of the local community. He didn't know how to engage the local community. And that's something that I knew how to do um, through my political background. And so we started working on this project together. It's actually the language of the birds, the flock of books. And I said to him, I said, you know what, your original idea, you got to check it. You got to really engage with this community um, and, 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 and work with them to come up with a new idea. And he said, do you want to work with me on this? And I literally had never held a power tool before in my life. And as you saw in that other photo, I, you know, with my, with my next artwork, I was up in the lift. I was part of every element of making all those artworks. And I, I learned so much and I loved working with my hands because even as a filmmaker, you're not really making something physically. You know, you're making a movie, but it's on celluloid or it's on digital or whatever. But I loved working with my hands. I loved making something physically. Um, and so that's how I got into it. Well, thank you so much again, uh, Dorga. I would like to, our next panelist uh, tonight is going to be Anita Yan Wong. Hi, Anita. Now, Anita is an Asian American painter who currently resides in Berkeley, California. Uh, she is best known for her expressive brush strokes and unique style of contemporary traditional paintings that truly provide tradition and modernity. Yale University's China Hands Magazine described her paintings as traditional art form that questions the modern minds. Uh, she is also a fourth generation Lingnan painter, uh, which is a style that originated in southern China um, in the late 19th century and is known for the fusion of mastering modern Chinese, Japanese, and Western painting approaches. Um, Anita has now uh, been a professor of the arts for over 14 years, but has recently um, shifted focus back to creating more work of her own. So Anita, thank you so much for being here. And I'm very particularly excited for the unique, very personal presentation that you have for us today. Thank you so much for having me here. I can't think of a better way to celebrate this month of March, but to be with you guys. So um, I know we have limited time. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and start. Uh, I think that's gonna be a little bit different. Uh, on the screen. So before I start, I want to ask you guys a question. So when was the last time you wrote a letter to someone? So before you answer this question, I'm going to let you answer this at the end of my presentation. So um, written by hand, this is according to knownhowstudio.com, written by hand, 50% of Americans 
says they haven't written a letter for over five years. But another survey reported, while we've stopped writing letters, we still want to receive them. So to celebrate this Women's History Month, I decided to write a personal letter to myself. Uh, so I actually went back and forth about my presentation for a little bit because I've been a professor for 15 years. I didn't want to do a lecture about uh, the history of women artists. I want it to be slightly more personal. So uh, if you're watching this as my student, you might find it a little bit different than my usual presentation. So here's a letter to myself. Uh, I'm gonna read it to you. Dear Anita, I wrote this letter for you on this Women's History Month as a reflection and celebration of what this month of March truly means to us. In the early summer of 1978, a baby was born. This baby might not know yet, but one day in the near future, she will find out she has a destiny of becoming artist. Inconsolably, the birth of this baby was not celebrated by her father nor her grandparents, simply because she was a girl. Although gender uh, equality is a fundamental human right, and although most agrees that every girl and boy deserves an equal chance to thrive and achieve their dreams in life, sometimes reality is merely the same as the perfect vision many societies seek. Today, many still face gender and race inequality since birth and throughout their lives. To leave the family drama caused by these old beliefs and traditions behind them, the little girl's mom took an overnight train and moved to the British-owned colony, Hong Kong. She was given an English name, Anita and learn the new language, Cantonese, Gong Dong Wa. The girl, now age five, also started learning art from a, a respected third generation Lingnan style painter, Xin Peng Jiu. So if you don't know about Lingnan style, I'm gonna briefly uh, explain what Lingnan style is. Lingnan style is a style of Chinese painting from um, more of the southern part of China, Lingnan region of China, founded in the 19th century, known for the fusion of Japanese art, Chinese art, and Western art. It was considered revolutionary uh, in this time. So there are three pillars of modern Chinese painting in the 19th century. One of them is Lingnan painting school. The other two is Shanghai school, Tianjin and Beijing school. So like many female painters in the past, Anita's teacher also adopted a rather feminine, uh, masculine male name, Peng Jiu. The meaning of Peng is wings of a giant bird. So Xin Peng Jiu mentioned that uh, her grandfather gave her a male name in hope that she'll become a great artist one day. Her father, who was a very famous general at the time, sent her to learn Chinese painting from a, a two very well-known 19th century Chinese painter. You might have heard of the name Zhao Xiaang, especially if you live in San Francisco, um, and also landscape figurative artist Pu Xinyu, who is also the cousin of the last emperor Pu Yi. So I don't think you have this slide here, but I have a picture on my screen of my teacher. Uh, I can show you perhaps later on my actual screen. Uh, so it's a picture of Zhao Xiaoang, one of the most famous Chinese painter in the 19th century and my teacher, and also a letter she wrote to me. So the next slide is the one with the airplane. Right here, yes. So after 10 years of dedicated Chinese painting study from Xin Peng Jiu, 
the young artist was offered an opportunity to learn from the best, which at the time was Zhao Xiaoang, through the recommendation of her teacher. However, tuition from such famous artists was not so affordable to her, nor to her single mom. Instead, a rather big decision was made to move to London and go to Central San Martin, University of the Arts London to study Western art. She continued her art studies in Maryland Institute College of Arts and became an art professor after graduating from two master's degree. Travel and art became part of her life, something that identify her. She now speaks three different languages, Putonghua, Gongdonghua, and English, have now lived her life in many cities. Because of the different cultural backgrounds she learned and experienced, the artist finds it difficult to put a single label on her art, whether it's Asian or Western, traditional or modern, she also is no longer able to verbally define who she is in a sentence. Rather, her art became a true reflection of who she is, a collection of memories and experiences over the many years of her travel. So here's some examples of her art. So I guess we'll just go through each slice and I will let it speak for itself. So that, that was an interview I did uh, this year with Daily Art. Uh, that was a painting that I did uh, for China Han, uh, Stanford University. And a painting tiger, rather abstract uh, that I did perhaps two years ago. The next slide is a more realist uh, painting I did. You can see the tiger is actually coming out of a frame. It's actually a self-portrait of myself. I don't want to be trapped in the frame. I want to kind of come out. And the next one is also with uh, Stanford. Um, it's an eye test. For you, for the audience to see what what do you actually see when you're looking at this traditional painting. The next slide is a uh, uh, art exhibition I had uh, at uh, a gallery in California, and a close up of one of the painting, uh, a kingfisher bird. And this one, the next one is a fish leaping out of uh, a polluted ocean. And another exhibition, solo exhibition I did in San Francisco. So these two paintings you see in the next slide, if we can click play on the next slide, uh, is actually augmented reality, reality work. So I don't know if you can click on it. Um, yeah, so it's actually animated when you wear your um, glasses, the augmented reality glasses, uh, the ink will actually come out uh, and fly at you and the audience can interact with the painting. The next one is uh, done actually last year for Bruce Lee 30 by 30. Uh, I was contacted by Disney and ESPN to do some paintings for their new film about Bruce Lee. So here's the film poster I did for ESPN. And last year I painted about a hundred ink kittens. Um, after I adopted my cats, I was really into painting cats. So the next slide shows you some uh, abstract cats. Uh, large scale and another cat painting that I did. All right, so let me also jump to the same slides as you. Okay, 
So let's come back to the letter I wrote for myself. In this Women's History Month, as I remembered how important art, travel, freedom, and equality is to me, I also think of the many Chinese women in the past who walked with lotus feet and the many people that are still facing gender inequality and race discriminations. During this Women's History Month, I picture a pair of bound feet from my great-grandparents' time that put limitation to both a woman's physical and mental freedom. I think of our activists, the guerrilla girls, fighting for the rights of women artists in front of MoMA in New York City during the, the 80s. I think of the audience lining up in front of MoMA to see what's considered the most influential art of our time titled An International Survey of Recent Paintings and Sculpture, only to find a lack of woman artists in the show. I picture myself going back in time, only to ask the question, where were all the women artists? As we celebrate this Women's History Month for the milestones we have made as a society, one can help but wonder, what a long, rocky way we came from. So this slide, I believe uh, we don't have it, but I ask myself if things are finally different. So here's some hope I wanna share with you guys. Although we've seen an increase of women artists and their influences in art in the last four decades, let us not forget the many women artists forgotten in our history, their sorrow and contribution in the art world we live in today. As an artist, I allow myself to imagine an art exhibition regardless of race, nationality, labels, or what drives the global art sales. As a fourth generation Lingnan artist, I can help a question. Although the talents of Lingnan female painter is no less than the leading male artist, male artists are highlighted in almost all of the past and current Lingnan art shows at major museums and institutions in both Eastern and Western countries. As a fourth generation female Lingnan artist, I imagine an art show that acknowledge the contributions and the lost work of Lingnan female artists. An art show that includes not just the rare work of Zhang Kunyi. So she's one of the seven masters praised as the Lingnan uh, Tian Feng Qizi, the heavenly breeze. But a body of work from many underrepresented Lingnan female artists, such as my teachers, their beautiful works perhaps one day being rediscovered again by the public and shown among the leading male painter that is currently representing the Lingnan art form. As an art educator, and to all the art historians out there, I want to ask you and myself, do we simply ignore these important work of art or to insert these women artists in the gaps of history books? Do we create new books about just the female artists but ignore and isolate them from their influences in the art movement as a whole? There are so much to consider. Here are some of the final slides. Throughout history, women have been working so hard, so hard to ensure that the female voice is heard. As African-American female artist Kara Walker silently testified in her work, the past isn't bad. It isn't even past. In this month of March, as we celebrate the woman's fears, woman of fears, and as a mass media and art society honors the non-female artists such as Cindy Sherman, Yayoi Kusama, Louise Bourgeois, 
of Kiev, and the very beloved uh, Frida Carlo. Let us also remind ourselves of what is not represented to us by the mainstream media. Let us think for a minute. And the current struggles, crisis we are facing as a society. Let's also dedicate this month of March to the tremendous amount of talent that are lost in our society and in our um, art history. And the contributions of these unsung heroes. And perhaps next time you are seeing a piece of artwork by a female artist, I suggest and may I suggest that we not only appreciate what's presented to us or in front of us, but to think deeper into the not so distant past that have guided so many of us to this moment, to the very moment that we are in today, the pain, the heartbreak, the revolution behind these beautiful artworks. Last but not least, I want to dedicate this Women's History Month to my mom. Uh, I would not be an artist without you. At the end of the day, we can endure much more than we think we can, Frida Carlo. And there's one more slide uh, that I want to add on today. Uh, so I don't know if you guys still remember the first question um, of my slide. When was the last time you wrote a letter to someone? So you think about it for a second. Before you say anything, I just want to um, briefly conclude. Um, our society right now is going through so much. As small business owners, as teachers, as students, as artists, as frontline workers, and as an individual. No matter what age you are, what gender you are, and what cultural background you have, we are all going through this tough time together during the pandemic. Perhaps now is a good time to give love and be united. Maybe now is a good time to write a letter, a note to someone, maybe as someone you love, a friend, a neighbor, or even a stranger that needs support or a good positive reminder that we will go through this tough time together just as we went through those tough days in the past, just as how we support each other during the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, just as we gave love and support our nation during 911. Just as we overcome the financial difficulties and crisis in 2008, we are strong and we will overcome this too together. Let us stand together, let us support each other and be united as Americans. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anita. S such an important, vital, vital message that everybody should take with them. And such, such a beautiful letter, beautiful words. Now, I want to. Um, I do want to touch on. You have. Um, you have a really valuable. Um, could it, more global perspective, you know, of art, would you, do you have any comments on the contrasts, any contrasts or comparisons there may be um, that we would see internationally, like versus um, here um, in America? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, so Katrina, that's a really good question. Um, so I think uh, overall, no matter what your location is, institutions, art galleries and art museum are very much driven by trend, I believe, whatever drives the global art sale. So as an artist, it's very hard to stay 
to stay away from labels. You know, I'm not saying labeling is not good because we do need to categorize ourselves. So we have a library, we have a timeline in our history and in art. However, to label is a very dangerous game. So for myself, I don't wanna label myself as Western art or Eastern art because I kind of limit my uh, thinking as an artist or as an art educator. So to answer your question, I believe um, right now our, our art market as a whole is very international. Um, a lot of times, uh, like the presentation we saw uh, earlier, female artists are very underrated. A lot of times that's driven by whatever trend uh, art galleries, art museum want to promote. Uh, which is, you know, very sad. Um, so I think overall, for me as an artist, I need to re remind myself constantly, I cannot be limited to location where I belong to. Uh, I just need to focus on what I'm passionate about. Absolutely, definitely an international language. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Um, thank you so much again, Anita, for the beautiful. Thank you for having me here today. Um, let me um, want to want to check in with everyone who's still watching with us. I'm seeing some lovely comments. You know, I have um, want to highlight another com um, comment there. Somebody um, commented, Anita, thank you for your um, kind words. So yes. So we thank her as well. Um, let me introduce our final panelist of the evening, uh, Priyanka Rana. Now, uh, Priyanka's um, inquiry um, into visual art started early in her life um, in India and followed her to France and finally to the San Francisco Bay Area, which she has called home for the past 12 years. She received her undergraduate degree in economics, mathematics, and English literature, and then went on to pursue an MBA. Uh, she started her professional journey as a research consultant and then pivoted her role as vice president of client services in the exhibitions industry to follow a more introspective path of creating art. Her work has since been exhibited in galleries, museums, is due to be installed in public space in the USA, and has been acquired by collectors from California and Shanghai. So, hi, Priyanka, thank you so much for being here with us today. Hi, Katrina, thank you. Thank you for having me, and um, what a wonderful panel uh, and timely for this month. Uh, so um, from my perspective, I want to share um, not about the history, but how uh, it is important and why we must push for women artists in the field um, and how being a woman has influenced my art and my art practice. And I'm going to share a few slides. So I want to talk about how um, being an artist, um, a woman artist has influenced my work um, and my art practice. and to cover those points and why we must push for more participation in the, in the field, I'm gonna talk about three points. Uh, firstly, I'm gonna talk about the need and the importance for uh, participation in the narrative through art. Uh, second, uh, balancing being a mom uh, and an artist and how that influences my art practice. And third, the changing ec ecosystem that enables us. To talk about the narrative, um, you know, uh, one of the reasons why I quit my professional journey and pivoted to creating art was because I felt I had these stories, these um, ideas to share and they were important. And, and I feel, uh, you know, the narrative plays such a key role in shaping our today, our tomorrow, and in, in some aspects, even influencing our past. And art is such a beautiful medium to share this narrative. And uh, it is important as a woman for me to share that perspective and um, and let that be part of the world. So I'm gonna talk about a few of my pieces and, and introduce some of the narratives that I felt were important for me to share with the viewers. So this this is, is one of the, it is actually the first piece that I created in metal 
Um, and it is rather raw, but it's one of my favorite pieces. It's titled Comb of History. Uh, it's my favorite piece because it talks about a concept that I've often grappled with, which is if we were to comb the history with women leading uh, the decision making, will our today, current today look different? Will the way the, the the way cities are designed look different? Will the way we, um, you know, solve uh, geopolitical conflicts look different? In fact, uh, will the way we are creating technology for future look different? And how far uh, into the history do we go and comb it to see where the gender divide started to happen? Uh, so I'm, I'm a woman and a mom of two, and being a mother has also had, um, you know, has had played a key role in influencing me and hence my artwork. And I do want to bring in that narrative into my my, my pieces. And um, to share my narrative, I also often borrow influential um, symbols in my work. So for instance, this piece on the left is called Brown Mama, where I have, I use old toys, which represents um, the chaos of motherhood. So when I, when I, wanted to introduce motherhood as a concept in my artwork, I did not want to bring it from the traditional perspective that we are used to, where more often than not, uh, it's been introduced from a male perspective. So I want to talk about, you know, the daily nuances of it, the joys, the anxiety, the, the chaos of it on a daily basis, a little bit more um, uh, intimate, um, so to speak. So this piece on the left is called Brown Mama, where I've used old toys as, as a singular body. And for face, I have borrowed a very um, powerful iconic symbol of Goddess Durga. Uh, she is a Hindu deity. I grew up in India. So a lot of my stories and narratives are seated in that um, region of the world. So this, uh, you know, I was drawn to the face of Goddess Durga because because of her multiplicity. Durga is both, um, you know, uh, she's a warrior, she's a mom, she is uh, a daughter and a wife. Uh, she's very powerful and yet very kind and humble. And I felt it's that multiplicity that I want to bring in when I when I was talking about um, what motherhood should, looks like to me. And then I have used the same symbol of Durga into this piece on the right side, which is titled Mrs. E. Uh, it's cast in aluminum and uh, anodized in brown. So I created that symbol uh, a little bit more mine in this piece of Durga, and I've given her a modern veneer um, through my medium. And um, I also, uh, so E stands for the energy, and uh, Durga also represents the seed of the energy of the universe which I felt to be true as, as I see so many women uh, around me who are holding the universe together, their universe together. And, um, and I felt I want to glorify that, that aspect of being a woman as well. And um, this part became all the more true during the pandemic when women stepped in so much more to keep their households afloat during the pandemic. And uh, this piece on the left is, uh, both these pieces were created during the pandemic. So they do bring in my narrative perspective that, um, that I felt in the last one year. So this piece on the left is titled Everyday Feet. And um, it is, of course, um, you know, it's, um, it's represents the migrant labor in India. Um, and she's wearing uh, Indian outfit, sorry, and she's wearing uh, jewelry. So India went through one of the toughest lockdowns during the pandemic and the migrant laborers had to walk. So um, migrant laborers had to walk um, quite many days to go back home and it was an arduous journey. And I want to capture um, how the pandemic impacted people um, disproportionately, um, you know, if they're socially or economically uh, disadvantaged. And yet, uh, which is also often seen how the women who were walking those miles uh, under heat during a pandemic were, you know, wearing, they still adorned their feet with jewelry and which you often see in India, even if somebody's, um, you know, economically disadvantaged, they still uh, take pride in, in adorning their feet with jewelry. And I thought that's such a symbol of hope that beauty brings uh, into our everyday uh, life. And this piece on the right is titled uh, Mama Duck. It is a self-portrait of sorts. And um, it's uh, the medium is ceramic, um, which is glazed. And uh, I want to 
capture that we we have so much more in common with different species on this planet, uh, with our instincts um, as as mother, and also that um, the anxiety that I felt in keeping my kids safe during the pandemic, I could be uh, flipping my feet under the water, but I kept a calm uh, being there for my kids to see. And um, I also wanted to talk about, um, you know, uh, the art practice and how that has influenced my art as well. So uh, like many women, I also leaned in so much more to keep my household afloat. And it was a frustrating experience to not have enough space and time to create art. And I felt um, the only uh, way I can turn that into a positive experience if I merged the lines a lot more between being a mother and an artist. That meant that my kids saw me um, create art more often. They became a part of it as well. Um, as uh, as viewers, as critiques, um, and you can see my son here uh, is helping put my posters. So um, and there's a funny incident. Um, my daughter was telling somebody who's she's four years old, and she was saying, "My mom is a cutter. She cuts wood. I guess because she saw me cut so much of wood this year." But um, it was interesting for me to see them as as viewers also because they were so around me while I was creating art. And I took that concept and I pitched it for a public art commission to the city of Palo Alto, where I, uh, you know, where I pitched that uh, we often neglect children as viewers in public art. And what if we include them, not just as viewers, but also as contributors? So um, I um, initiated a drive where they could donate old toys plastic toys and I will be using them and creating a, a piece that will go um, on uh, Johnson Park in Palo Alto this Saturday. And you can see how my son is helping me uh, put posters around the town for this drive, this toy drive. And it was fascinating also to see how many parents and mostly of course moms uh, and one dad who took time during this very busy you know, schedules that we running during pandemic to donate toys because they were so excited uh, to participate and the kids want to come back and see. Um, going back, um, you know, to Brown Mama, I had initially used old toys from my perspective of chaos, but it was interesting to see the reaction of my kids when I had made the sculpture. They were both fascinated on how toys come together as a singular form and also horrified on what a wastage of a good toy is on a sculpture. So I want to, you know, include kids in, in, in that way for my public art um, uh, commission. So it's going to look a bit like this piece that I'd created. Uh, this one is titled Concentric. It's on a larger base. Uh, you can see on the on the right side. Um, and I will be, I have already installed a layer of toys and I will be installing on the other side um, tomorrow. And you can also see how I've turned my porch into my studio, which allowed me to have more access to my uh, kids and my kids you know, had more access to me and it allowed me to create more art. Um, so hence, you know, blending the boundaries kind of helped uh, during the pandemic. And lastly, I also want to talk about how uh, the entire ecosystem enables it. For instance, um, you know, Katrina uh, from IMF have felt that it was important for our narratives to be heard, which enables these stories further. And uh, my art is primarily bought by women because I guess the narrative that I share does speak to them on a personal level. And then that is what needs to uh, move further. We need to participate as creators. We need to participate as viewers. We need to participate as buyers. And we need to participate as critiques and in the institutions and move the needle in the right way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Priyanka. You know, I'm so, what has, what has really, I want to touch on something for a second. Um, what has really um, intrigued me kind of in a historical context too, there are, um, you know, whether they're cultural symbols or otherwise, um, females have actually been prevalent, you know, yeah. um, goddesses in different cultures. Um, but represented by men <laughs> and depicted yes. by men. So it's, it's um, sort of um, 
confounding to me how the female um, perspective of that, which is so beautifully shown in in your work, um, wasn't is is only rec is only recently modern, um, you know, um, seen. You know why um, do? But they've kind of always been in the background as well. So yeah. it's really something interesting to think about that dynamic that has played out through history, you know, because it's it's been there. Very very strong female symbols have been there, but <laughs> but it's the narratives, I guess. You know, the narratives were missing from the female perspective mm -hmm. to go with the symbols. Yeah. So something I wanted to comment on. No, no, that's that's a fair point. And I, I, I think about that too. You know, we were especially growing up in India, there are these powerful symbols, and yet the gender equity is so wide. Um, I guess again, the narrative perhaps. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <sighs> All right. Well, I really do want to give one more huge. Thank you to our panelists here. You are all truly amazing artists and women who are continuing to blaze a trail for the future of female artists everywhere. So thank you so very much. Um, so I would now like to open this discussion up to any comments or questions that you may have. Um, just a reminder, I am monitoring um, your comments on Facebook. You can also drop in using that Zoom ID, come and ask something live. Um, in the meantime, I do have a couple of questions to end our evening that I would like to pose to our panelists. Um, so perhaps our most, our main topic and the most important question, uh, what would be your advice for today's female artists, female artists who are striving to get their work shown? I guess I can try to answer that. It's a really interesting, good question. So my advice is social media. Social media is a very powerful tool. Uh, however, I think you need to make friends have a support group on your social media. Um, you can't really rely on just one thing. I think it's very important, like what I mentioned earlier, not to follow any trend. It's more important for you to not limit yourself. You could, you know, like um, follow a trend and think, okay, I'm going to be perhaps trendy. I'm going to be in the group, um, but you are limiting your creativity. And I think creativity is the most important thing. You need to create your own trend. You need to lead the trend. Um, and also, I think, you know, most importantly, just focus on being yourself because every, everybody, every individual is uh, very special, very different than the other. So when I create my work, a lot of times I see it as my own signature. So perhaps you can find your own signature. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. The, in the world of um, in the world of social media that we live in, um, of course, what the, you know, what a, what a tool it has skyrocketed people to and what um, you know, it's, um, it's great. It's an amazing, it's an amazing tool, you know. Um, also, like you touched on, don't be afraid to break those, to break those barriers, break those hashtags, break those trends. You know, I think that's still fundamentally what it, um, especially what art should be about. So thank you very much. All right. Any other panelists would like to comment on that question? advice you would give? I guess I'd also say that um, you also have to identify who does your art speak to. Um, for instance, I have realized since I do often, you know, in my narratives, include topics which are very close to um, the geography that I grew up in. And I've realized that that art may speak to 
uh, people who are understanding those icons that I'm using or um, have a, already a relationship with those symbols that I'm using. Mm -hmm. really. I would also add that um, no artist should limit uh, themselves, uh, himself or herself uh, with anything. They should be free in their expression, regardless of their gender. Don't think that you are a female and you have to express uh, yourself in a way, it, it will limit yourself. Don't let uh, any different difference to limit your creativity. Absolutely, thank you. Um, the next question I would like to ask is that you are all seemingly, you know, very career driven and have indeed accomplished great success in the art world, professionally speaking. So to what would you say, do you owe your success? So I'll, I'll take that question. I feel um, uh, I've been very lucky that I, given the time that I've been creating art and the response that I've had um, is, is tremendous. And I feel some of it is in, that you have to be honest because if you're honest, then it you know it speaks to the audience, um, and there will be uh, a response accordingly. And second, I guess it's also about experimenting. You have to just keep creating and experimenting, um, and it may lead you to a beautiful path. Um, and I'm speaking from my experiences of just experimenting with old toys, and you know it's led to a public art commission. Um, so I guess just keep experimenting and being honest about what you want to create. That's right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I'll jump in and say, just um, follow your heart. Simple and true, yeah. So and I think um, a very important question um, for the modern women, you are some, um, so many artists, women in particular, um, tend to um, struggle with balancing, you know, what their life, their busy lives, what they have going on, and their artistic passion. So, what would be your what would be your advice to them finding that balance and finding time for their art? Uh, I may uh, very much relate to that. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I don't have any art. Uh, I didn't went to art school, my education, I studied uh, psychology and I studied management economics and I uh, now work at uh, public uh, um, department of public health. And I try, I, it's not a difficult for me to, I, I don't try to choose between my uh, career, professional career and in um, management and in public sector and art. I, I think they balance each other. If I did uh, just concentrate it on art, maybe I would, I'm not saying get tired of, but, but I need both. Uh, they keep me balanced. I find time for my art uh, and I also find time uh, for my career. And I also find time for the art gallery, which I enjoy uh, curating uh, exhibitions for our artists. Mm -hmm. So it, whatever you do, you have to do it uh, with love. And it, it, the more you do, it, the more time you'll find for things. I never had any problem with time management because when, when you don't like something and you think, oh, th this is work I have to do, that uh, changes your approach and it becomes a burden for you. But when you do things with love, um, I think you don't have to make a choice. You, you just enjoy, you jump from, uh, I, uh, for, for me, I uh, paint and then I go uh, curate the art, uh, the exhibition, and then I go and work in my public sector. So I, I enjoy um, all the aspects of my life. Mm -hmm. This is a very fun question. I like all your answers. Um, but to be honest, I can never keep it really balanced. You know, um, I just want to give a art quote uh, by Salvador Darley. So Darley, he said, I wake up every morning feeling happy because I'm Darley. 
I'm a painter. So I kind of feel the same way. So it's really hard, you know, um, the pandemic make us all think very differently. So um, many years ago, I quit my job as a professor. It was a really hard decision. Uh, I just want to do what I'm passionate about, to be an artist, to paint, because life is so short. I want to follow my passion. However, you know, you do have to care about the realistic part of your life, which is to take care of the financial part and everything else. So I was uh, very fearful. And also, um, I create traditional art. As we all know, a lot of people don't really write a letter anymore. They text message, my student text message, we write email. So to actually create traditional art and uh, support myself as a living, it was quite fearful. I didn't want to follow any trend and fall into the um, abstract ink category, which definitely was driving the global art sale. I didn't want to follow any trend. So I was lost as an artist for quite a long time. So I think to keep a balance between all these complex elements in life, you just need to just go through the tough time and really tell yourself, you know, this is my life. I can make a choice and being an artist makes me happy. So I think at the end, um, it depends on what you want. You just need to follow your passion. If you think, okay, I'm going to use 10 hours of my day just to do my art. I can really, you know, do the rest of my housework. I think it's worth it. I think as long as you are happy as an artist, it's fine. And so that will be my answer. <laughs> Thank you. Well, for me, I, as I briefly touched in my uh, conversation before, is I had to merge my lines because if I was looking for that perfect time, that perfect space, it didn't happen at least during the pandemic. And it taught me that I had to merge my line as a mom and, and as an artist and just let things flow in and carve whatever space that I could. And, and Katrina has been witness to it when um, for my previous talk, we were on a call and my daughter joined in. And initially I would try to have a perfectly quiet space. And then I'm like, okay, come in and join. And 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 I guess I'm really already knocking on the door because we are back from the park. Uh, and I guess uh, you have to carve, as you said, Anita, as well, you have to find the aha movements, right? What made you happy? And then hold on to that and try to create more and more of those times. Um, and if that's creating art, then what a wonderful way to, to contribute to the world. Yeah, absolutely. Whether it's your, your family, your friends, maybe they can, maybe they can be a part of it. Be part of that time that you dedicate, you know, to your art and to your creativity. So make make that time be dedicated, definitely. Um, one one final question I have for you guys um, tonight. You know, I think that we would um, all agree that education and mentorship is extremely important to any emerging artist, person finding themselves. Um, so what is your um, opinion regarding arts education today? You know, um, especially when it comes to youth who need that outlet. Um, and how do you think we can improve possibly? So I'll, I'll take that question um, because uh, that's a question that I ask myself as well, because I'm not trained in art. And, and uh, sometimes it is frustrating because that means I have to go back um, to the basics on my own. And I also, since sculpting is a technical um, medium where I have to learn how to use power tools and how to teach myself. And I guess um, it's a longer way without art education. I'm not saying that's the only way, but it's a longer way. It's fun sometimes because the, what can also happen is that you're experimenting more and then you may come up with your own process in, in, in that evolution. But I'd say for somebody who's emerging is to find places and there are enough institutions uh, that to my surprise that I found when I wanted to learn how to sculpt uh, or certain techniques is to find institutes that are giving those uh, workshops, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So I will also try to answer the question. So I have been an art professor for over 15 years. So the art school I taught at was uh, SBA, School of Visual Art in New York City, uh, Temple University, Maryland Institute College of Art, and recently UC Berkeley. Um, the art education background I had, the first one was Hong Kong, Univers uh, Hong Kong Polytechnic University, Art and Design. And I went to Central St. Martin, uh, London uh, University of the Arts. And I came to Maryland Institute College of Art to do my 2M uh, master degree. So one thing I can speak of is that our world is getting smaller and smaller day by day. Everybody travels. Um, international art is becoming more and more important. You can limit yourself to just study Eastern art or Western art. Our world, whether you like it or not, is becoming really, really connected. So um, for me as an art educator, I think it's very important that you go around the globe, travel more and study from uh, whether it's individual artists like what I did from Simpongjiu or our institutions. Uh, don't limit yourself to one location. If you can, I will recommend you to travel and study overseas. Yeah, that awareness, I definitely agree. Yeah, it's key. <laughs> I guess so we have um, actually one, one question from Facebook, it's actually for um, uh, Larissa, a poignant question. Where do you get all your eggshells? <laughs> what are your resources? <laughs> yeah, I, I was expecting this question. Um, it, I, I think that's the easiest part of what I do. I, I get them from store, just oh. supermarket. And uh, the exotic uh, eggs uh, I get from internet, there are, uh, and the, remember I told about the paratex, the tiny ones, my neighbors gave it to me, they know that uh, I'm using actual so uh, they have um, parrots and they uh, collected the eggs and they're still giving uh, every spring or whatever season they uh, have eggs, they are collecting and giving to me. So yeah, and there are uh, the ostrich farms. I get the ostrich from there. Uh, emu also I buy from there. Uh, but um, another question that follows the first question is what do you do with all those eggs? So you, you, you use the shells, but what do you do with the inside of the eggs? And uh, for a long time, uh, I, I was not using them. I was throwing them away, but I always wanted to use them somehow. And recently, before the pandemic, of course, uh, I started cooking those eggs and going. Uh, we were going to the uh, streets where there are more uh, homeless people. And in Los Angeles County, we, we have many streets like that. So uh, I was cooking the eggs at home, making omelets and uh, putting in small boxes and we started distributing them to the homeless people. At first, I didn't know how, uh, what to expect their reaction, if they'll be happy to take it, whether they'll take it or not. But when I saw how happy they were uh, when we were giving this uh, omelets to them, it was, uh, I started questioning myself uh, whether I enjoyed the creating process or this giving process. It was really beautiful experience. And I hope this pandemic will end soon and I will continue doing that. Oh, let's do we all. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. It's, it's uh, been, you, you know, nobody can ref reflect on it without seeing the challenge, you know, the challenges that we faced this past year. Um, definitely, but be hopeful, be hopeful, you know, you um, look at the work you guys are doing for the um you know, for your communities, and I can't um, wait to follow what you um, do in the future. You know, um, I want to hopefully um, 
be able to exhibit exhibit you guys to the public you know i want to say um um be on the uh lookout in our exhibition spaces because i would love to invite I, um, these ladies to come and be a part of the official yama family of artists <laughs> So I hope that can be a future, um, future endeavor. Um, all right. Well, everyone, I want to thank you again for joining us today. Um, please remember to follow that in, um, information in the comment and chat. If you have any, anything lingering, you can get more information on these panelists too. find out how to contact them, more about their art um, and, how, and how to follow them.